Do certified green buildings cost more? Well, not exactly. We have <clears throat> uh, a lot of data on this now from diverse lead buildings. Uh, the first 33 looked at in California averaged under 2% extra capital costs, five of them were zero. Average benefits in order of magnitude greater than that, 25 to 40% returns on investment. And LEED is, does not guarantee ideal energy performance, it's a great checklist for integrative design, but these buildings weren't yet tunneling through the cost barrier. And there's a more recent uh, and interesting study <clears throat> that interleaves blue buildings which are non-LEED, green which are seeking the lowest level of LEED certification, silver seeking LEED silver, gold seeking LEED gold or platinum, and you see they're all interleaved looking at the cost of these various buildings, 45 of them contrasted with 93 comparable non-LEED buildings normalized for time and location. No statistically significant correlation between LEED status and construction cost. I think it's going to turn out as we learn more about this that what does correlate with, with the cost is simply how experienced your designers are, whether they can do a good building freehand as easily as a bad building. And well, in an experiment that Ralph and I uh, helped Pacific Gas and Electric with back in the 90s called Act Squared. Uh, <clears throat> one of the experimental buildings that was designed and built is this ordinary looking tract house in Davis where it could go to plus 45C. Later we did the same trick at plus 46. And uh, this has the obligatory stupid dark roof and yet it's comfortable without an air conditioner at those high temperatures. And the original design was set up to save four-fifths of the energy allowed by what was then the strictest code in the country, or it was about ten times more efficient than an average U.S. house, and yet if built in quantity it would be cheaper to build and cheaper to maintain than a regular house because it didn't have any heating or cooling equipment to have to mess with. Or in steamy Bangkok, one of the toughest climates on the planet, uh, our friend Professor Bunyatakarn uh, built this 350 square meter house <coughs> Uh, let's see, 13 years ago, that is comfortable with only a tenth the normal air conditioning energy and didn't cost any extra to build. So in these three houses spanning the range of the Earth's climates pretty much, there's a common story, namely these houses were optimized as a whole system for multiple benefits, rather than just optimizing a piece of them like the insulation or the windows for single benefits. And through this integrative design, getting multiple benefits from single expenditures, uh, it was possible to eliminate or nearly eliminate, in the Bangkok case, the space conditioning equipment and the energy to run it uh, at the same or lower capital cost with the same or better comfort. Now, this may seem incredible, uh, like growing bananas in the Rockies uh, to, uh, to, say, economists, but uh, that's just because they're steeped in the old design mentality of diminishing returns, that the more energy you save, the more and more rapidly or steeply the cost of the next unit of savings goes up until it gets too expensive and you have to stop. However, <clears throat> although that's true of, say, the insulation in my house, that's just how insulation works, if you add enough insulation, there's another part of the curve. You get to the point where you no longer need the furnace, ducts, fans, pipes, pumps, wires, controls, fuel supply arrangements. So their entire capital cost goes away and that's more than you paid to get rid of them. So the house gets cheaper to build, but now you're saving 99% of the space heating energy. And why should we get there the long way around when we can tunnel through the cost barrier directly to that design destination by asking, is there a sensible way to build this house without needing heating and cooling equipment. Well, it turns out, yes, there is. There usually is. And there are two ways to tunnel through the cost barrier, at least. The more common way is just to do the whole system design I described, getting multiple benefits from single expenditure. So in the house cases I just referred to, there's a saving of energy and there's a saving of capital. Two benefits, not one. But there are, as I'll describe later, 10 benefits from super windows. 18 from very efficient motors, 18 from lighting ballasts, and so on. And you can do this sort of thing throughout the design. The arch that holds up the middle of my house has 12 different functions or benefits, but I only pay for it once. I'll tell you later what those are. In fact, here we are. 
It holds up the greenhouse glazing. It supports the roof purlins slotting in, holding up the roof of the house. It distributes cantilevered loads that shift around according to the degree of loading of the earth sheltered roof as we put that in. It holds up the atrium lights. It has an acoustic and an aesthetic function. It provides thermal mass. It controls the solar gain in the atrium seasonally. That is, light, low angle winter light can skim in under the arch to the back of the house. High angle summer sun, which would overheat the back if I let it do that because there isn't a high vent back there, is confined by the geometry of the arch within the forward part of the atrium where the hot air rises up and we can run it out of vent. Uh, also, the arch doubles as a hot air collector and a hot water collector. It's a daylight distributor and it carries vents for excess heat, so 12 functions, one cost. And indeed, most components of that building do at least three jobs, otherwise they don't earn their way on board. Uh, <clears throat> there's a design like this in the front end of a Lotus Elise car, a part that has seven functions but one cost, and it's sure a lot more fun to design this way the way nature designs, where hardly anything has a single purpose. Now, let me make this a little more concrete. Uh, in a small office in Denver, if, if you were to do a typical design and then a typical analysis of, say, a developer who wants to make it better, the design professionals might come back and say, well, if I pay an extra $4,900 I could save you almost $1,600 a year, that's a three-year payback, uh, by having better daylighting. And I can improve all these other components. And the trouble is, the developer may say, well, I only want one-year paybacks, so I'm short of cash this year, and then none of this stuff gets done. Funny thing, though, <coughs> the developer forgot that if you do all of these things, which are not individually cost-effective by that ridiculous measure, then you also save a lot of money on the heating and cooling equipment, and you can make it smaller and simpler and also change some window costs, and you end up with an incremental construction cost that nets out to just one year of energy saving. So you get a 70% energy saving with about 100% return on investment per year. Or in another building in, in a cold climate, Grand Forks, North Dakota, uh, in this one, $160,000 saving on heating, ventilating, and air conditioning equipment uh, turned out to more than pay for all the other improvements. So the building was $36,000 cheaper than normal to build and saved $75,000 a year worth of energy. You know, you get a funny reaction when you show developers enough uh, <clears throat> numbers like this. Most of them get it real fast, but some of them have been to business school, uh, and, they say, and they're so conditioned to thinking more efficient must cost more that they say, so what's the payback? And you go over it again and show that it costs less to build, and they say, yeah, but what's the payback? And you say, it costs less to build, less up front. What part of that don't you understand? This can be a very curious conversation. Capital cost. It's very similar with the integrated design. It's about 1% less than you started with. Operating cost is about 80% less than you started with, if all other things are equal. That should not be a difficult decision. And this choice, you notice, does not depend on your discount rate. It does not depend on the price of energy. It just depends on understanding what you can do with imaginative design. The same logic applies to, let's say, a New York City apartment. There's a registered architect in New York, Chris Benedict, and, and she designs new apartments that save about 85% of the normal energy use there for heat and hot water, and they don't cost extra to build. She does airtight construction because air leaks cause about half the normal heating and a lot of the cooling load in, in the city. Uh, she does innovative ventilation and she has working thermostats properly calibrated in every room because you know the, the inside and outside and the front and back of the building and so on all have different things going on with heat gain and loss and you need to adjust each for comfort rather than uh, heating or cooling the whole building to make the least favorable room in the building. Uh, <clears throat> this is a 22 unit apartment, uh, get to the temperature you want. 
So it turns out that all these improvements are more than paid for by dramatically downsizing the heating equipment. Uh, so this building has only an eight inch chimney, which is smaller than on many single family houses. And she also puts insulation outside the structural concrete to trap thermal mass inside, just as I do in my house with foam in the middle of the walls. The inner masonry acts as trap thermal mass. And half of your uh, comfort sensation is actually the radiant temperature. Only the other half uh, is the air temperature measured by the thermostat. So if you can arrange for the air and radiant temperature to vary out of phase with each other, the average of the two that you experience as comfort uh, will be a lot more even through the year.